that. And it's an honor to introduce Dave, who's going to talk with us today. We're looking forward to that. Former e evangelical minister, and so we had to wire him up for such a purpose. Good, good to see you. Thank you. I'm all wired up. That could be dangerous. Wow. Good morning. There are more of you here than when I sat down there in the front row. I'm going to follow that poem with another poem. This is by Mario de Andrade, Brazilian poet, and I'm only going to read it in English, because <laughs> that's all I can do. It's called, my, my Soul Has a Hat. I counted my years and realized that I have less time to live by than I have lived so far. I feel like a child who won a pack of candies. At first, he ate them with pleasure, but when he realized that there was little left, he began to taste them intensely. I have no time for endless meetings where the statutes, rules, procedures, and internal regulations are discussed, knowing that nothing will be done. I no longer have the patience to stand absurd people who, despite their chronological age, have not grown up. My time is too short. I want the essence. My spirit is in a hurry. I do not have much candy in the package anymore. I want to live next to humans, very realistic people, who know how to laugh at their mistakes, who are not inflated by their own triumphs, and who take responsibility for their actions. In this way, human dignity is defended, and we live in truth and honesty. It is the essentials that make life useful. I want to surround myself with people who know how to touch the hearts of those for whom hard strokes of life have learned to grow with sweet touches of the soul. Yes, I'm in a hurry. I'm in a hurry to live with the intensity that only maturity can give. I do not intend to waste any of the remaining desserts. I'm sure they'll be exquisite much more than those eaten so far. My goal is to reach the end, satisfied and at peace with my loved ones and my conscience. We have two lives, and the second begins when you realize you only have one. Those are some words, a poem that someone sent me recently, um, a couple months ago, not long after my diagnosis of ALS, and. Um, it really struck to the core of, of what I'm trying to do with the balance of my life. I look pretty healthy, don't I? Um, that's, that's the nature of ALS. It's, it's unpredictable. It's, um, you don't really, it, it starts, it started with me and my hands and fingers and arms where I'm losing strength. Um, some people it starts in their, in their tongue and mouth, some it starts in their hand, I mean their feet. So it's, it's a very uh, irregular, unpredictable, um, nasty, nasty disease. Um, when I got the diagnosis on February 26th of this year, I uh, had been having symptoms for the better part of a year prior to that. So I knew something was wrong, I just didn't know what it was. And um, so... The, uh, the diagnosis was, was a wake-up call in many ways, but it's not, oh, there's people up there, hi. <laughs> yeah, this is fun. This is a great place, by the way, I love this. Love I may move to Minneapolis, this is pretty cool. <laughs> Don't get too excited, you got down. I say all kinds of things and mean half of it. Um, but I was, an, I was an evangelical Christian for about 37 years. And for much of that time, I was a pastor. Um, so I've done a lot of this kind of talking. Usually I would open with a passage of scripture and we'd, we'd break that apart. But um, I let that go a long time ago, about seven years ago. I now identify as an atheist. Um, for a while, I used the soft A word, the little A, agnostic, because I felt like it was a little less threatening to a lot of people. And it is, because the word atheist is a word that just makes people jerk back uh, and, and hope that you're not going to hit them in the face. <laughs> but 
I'm really on kind of a little crusade here to try to take back that word, uh, or not take it back. It's not like we ever had it, but um, to destigmatize it and to help people as much as we can um, realize that we're not bad people. We're not angry. We're not mad at God. We're not I, I'm mad at, I've started to say not mad at anyone, but with the current political state, I really can't say that. <laughs> <sighs> such as it is um, we're not we're not unkind we're not you know sacrificing babies in the basement at night we're not doing anything evil and wrong we're just simply don't believe in God and I've told several Christians that you're you and I are both athe atheists I just believe in one fewer God than you do <laughs> feel free to use that it's it's free <laughs> No royalties needed. Um, so I'm on a little bit of a crusade to uh, destigmatize the word atheist. I think it's, it's getting a bad name, and, and I want to show people in my Christian world, my family. I've still got a lot of evangelical Christians in my family. Um, two of my kids still are, my brother, my mom. So they, uh, they want, I want them to see that my atheist people are some of the most kind and loving people I've ever met in my life. I'm, I'm surrounded by an incredible community of people in Nashville, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, um, who are atheists and agnostics, and most of them former Christians. Um, I don't know how many of you used to be on the other side, but um, most of the people in my world that are my closest friends are people that used to be like I was. You, you, we had, my whole life was sold out to Jesus. I, became a, a Jesus freak in 1973. And I did street preaching and coffee house ministry, and I believed that Jesus was coming back next week. So I, I, I didn't go to college, I didn't pursue a career, I was that serious about spreading the gospel and, and seeing people uh, converted to Christianity because I believed it with all my heart that it was the correct and right way to live. And if someone didn't live that way, they were in danger of of hellfire and brimstone, and I didn't want that. So I was, I was, um, I was very diligent with that, and, and, it, and it was it consumed my life for the next three and a half decades. Um, and and it's embarrassing to admit now that I never once, until late in life, stopped and 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 made an examination of the faith to which I'd given my life, and I never really examined what it was all about, where it, where it came from, what the origins of it were, what it was, what, what, where did it come from, what is this all about? I never compared it, I didn't sit down, and most people of faith never do this. They never sit down and say, let me lay out all the religions of the world and do a careful analysis of each one, and then I'm going to choose the one that makes the most sense to me. We don't do that. We just assume the one we're, we're born into. And whatever part of the world you happen to be born into, that's the religion you're going to assume. So when I began to examine some things like that, the exclusivity of faith, um, the atonement, uh, those kind of things began more and more to bother me. Uh, the concept of hell uh, began to really bother me. And um, so I let go of Christianity, and then for a few years, I kind of tiptoed and didn't make a big deal, kind of stayed under undercover a little bit. I mean, the people close in my life knew my story because I, I didn't feel like I could live an authentic life if I was living in the closet, so to speak. Um, so my kids, my family, my closest friends, I told them all I no longer believe. Um, and many of them left me. Um, my, my two daughters uh, dissociated from me. Um, so it cost me a lot, to be honest. And I found that that's often true. And many times we... we are dishonest because we're afraid of the toll that it would take and, and the cost that we'd have to pay. But over the years, as I've grown increasingly distant from my past as a Christian, I have begun to really speak out more and more in, in opposition to it. In, 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 because I believe that the core fundamental values of evangelical Christianity are very dangerous and toxic. The idea that we teach children that they're awful that they're sinful, they're dirty, they need a savior. Um, the idea that there is a place called hell that, that a God created 
for people who don't believe in Jesus. Um, the, 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 uh, the idea that this could be true, I'm going to read you something. The idea that this scenario could be true. Anne Frank is now in hell. Ted Bundy is now in heaven. Does that make sense to any rational human? No, it doesn't. But the core of evangelical Christianity teaches that. Because Ted Bundy, late in life, after all the things he did, repented, accepted Jesus as his Savior, and is now in heaven. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's one reason I don't want to go there. Just saying. Preach. Um, and, and Frank, raised as a Jew and a teenager, never, according to historians, never converted to the true religion, Christianity. So she was, uh, uh, died as a Jew. And, and fundamentalist evangelical Christianity teaches that if you don't accept Jesus as your Savior, I'm sorry, it's, I hate it, but you've got to go to the bad place. Which, by the way, all the best people are going to be. So it's going to be a party. So <laughs> the, I, the idea, and, I've, and I, when I propose this to Christians, they get really upset about it, as you might imagine. They don't like it. No, no, no. So they'll say things like, well, God knows who, who's or his, and God has ways, and who knows if Anne Frank at the end didn't say a silent prayer. <sighs> you know, and all that nauseous excuse-making, trying to excuse the barbarity of their God. And I'm so glad I don't have to do that anymore because that's exhausting. Um, but the idea that a theology could make room for that scenario to be possible, whether or not it's true that it happened, that theology says it's possible. Mm -hmm. I got a problem with that. And, and so I'm becoming more vocal because I got nothing left to lose. Um, <laughs> I meant to ask my buddy Drew if, if you can swear from the pulpit, so I guess I better not. <laughs> I'm all out of fucks. <laughs> so, um, I see some of you are too. Um, in fact, we realized in talking to my friends the other night, I've got a fuck deficit. I'm, I'm, I'm in the red on fucks. So... I may need to borrow some of yours. Um, David, I don't want to go too long, so what's the time I'm looking at? I, I, I can get out of control real easy. You go for it. You go for it, and I'll come tap you on the shoulder. I okay, fair enough. Don't worry about it. Fair enough. So I, I've been really um, becoming more vocal. I've been doing a lot of podcasts and, and traveling and speaking like this. And don't get me wrong, I'm not angry at Christianity or angry at God because I don't believe he's there and you can't be angry at someone that you don't believe exists. That's kind of silly. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I'm not mad at, at, you know, Maya Angelou says, do the best you can until you know better and then do better. And that's what I'm trying to do. So I gave everything I had to the imaginary God I believed in and it turned out to be false and I have regrets. I wasted a lot of years that I wish I could get back. But I was doing the best I knew how. And that's all we can do. And I was giving it everything I had. And so I'm not on a crusade to demonize that. But I do want to raise my hand and say, wait a minute. I think that's really harmful. I think that's really bad to teach that. And I, I would like to see it go away. And so I, I, I want to... To point out the, you know, and that's what I do when I talk to people. I point out the problems with it in the areas, the, the things they teach. The idea that everybody in the world is wrong except me. That all the religions are wrong except the one I happen to be born into. Lucky me, unlucky you. That's repulsive. And, and all kinds of arrogant. But that's what, that's what we believe. And, and, you know, the truth is all the religions can't be right, but they can be wrong. And, and that's what I think it comes down to. So the idea of original sin, atonement, exclusivity of faith, and the aforementioned hell, um, those are problems for me. I find that to be problematic. So now, um, as, as an ex-Christian atheist, I've been living my life and, and living my best life authentically and 
with a, with a great community of atheist friends and, and just living, um, living for the moment. Because um, I, I, when I came out of Christianity and rebooted my life, I, I began to realize that life is not composed of some great scheme and big plan that God has a, one, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Anybody ever heard that one? Um, he doesn't, by the way. Um, so there's no big thing that all fits together. It's just a, a series of random moments. It's a collection of moments. Life happens. Life just happens. And so the best we can do, the most we can do, is seize the moments. Carpe the fucking diem. That's a, <laughs> that's a motto I live by. It's, it's sti stitched on a pillow in my, in my house. And, and it's, it was my mantra before ALS. And now it's my mantra on steroids. It's just... There are moments out there in life that are beautiful and wonderful, and we have to be looking for them, we have to be recognize them, and then we have to seize them. And so, when I, when I went to the doctor on February 26th um, this year, I, I'd been to a series of doctors, and I knew that something was wrong, I didn't know what it was. You know, the internet can be your best friend or your worst enemy, right? So I'm checking Google to see what, you know, Googling symptoms, and. I knew ALS was on the table um, as an option, and <clears throat> of course I was hoping it wasn't that. And um, uh, I, I went to, I knew that once I started to see doctors, I'd need to go to this one and that one, and they'd be tests, and so I waited till the first of the year because insurance and deductibles and other things we need to fix in this country. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> So anyway, after a series of doctors and tests and neurologists, excuse me, I um, went to the um, test that, that is a surefire test, the EMG. And I told the, the young neurologist that I really wanted him to just tell me the truth, not candy coat it, not sugar coat it, just, you know, give me the straight poop. And he said, I will. And I said, so are the results immediate? I mean, you know, he said, yeah, it's right here on the screen. So I said, do I have ALS? And he said, yeah, you do. And, um, and then he paused a minute and he said, I, I'm sorry to give you this diagnosis, but you have ALS. And then it was quiet and it was just me and him in the room and I'm half naked as you are in those situations. And I said, okay, well, that's good to know. Um, and then he said, well, um, there's the exit and the elevators around the corner. And I said, oh, should I get dressed? Yeah. <laughs> and it was over. Yeah. And <laughs> I do this every time. Feel free to cry along. Um, group crying is that we do have an extra, is that in the program? <laughs> My life changed. Um, and, you know, I've learned since then that neurologists aren't, they don't have the best bedside manner. <laughs> you know, you might want to, is there a pamphlet you have on what I might do next? Anything? You got anything here for me? You know, and, and so it's this disease that stops doctors in their tracks, I was told by a doctor. Uh, they don't have any cures, no treatments that are shown to be really effective. They got a few things, you can try this, here's a pill, might help you give you three or four months extra. So the diagnosis is pretty um, grim. Uh, it's three to five years life expectancy um, from diagnosis. Um, I've seen people live a lot longer um, and I've seen people go quicker. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just unknown. And I don't know how long I've got functionality. I don't know how long I can do this. If I can't do this, what's the point of living? So. My goal is to live as hard and, and as much as I can. And, and so when I got the diagnosis, I um, made some really rapid decisions. I retired from the work I was doing. I moved in with, with friends, atheist friends. How can atheist friends be kind and loving? They don't have any morality without God. How does that, that makes no sense. They're mean, evil people. But, exactly, so, but no, uh, I knew I didn't need to be living alone anymore. I had an apartment in downtown Nashville, and so I retired. I started selling off stuff that I knew I'd never use again. Golf clubs, not going to hit a golf ball again. Uh, guitar, not going to play guitar again. Um, 
and I just embraced it and made a decision to do what I'm doing now, which is what we call dying out loud. Um, traveling to see places I want to see. I just got back from Italy last month with some good friends. I'm traveling and doing as much of this as I can. Marie is booking me on podcasts and, and speaking. I, I just want to talk about dying, dying with dignity. I want to talk about uh, living out loud, living your best life, not letting life pass you by, uh, realizing that we, we only have one life. And we have to grab it and do it the best we can, as hard as we can. And, and I don't want to miss anything. People have asked me, are you afraid of dying? So that's the deal. See, I used to be a Christian who believed that once we die, we go to heaven. Because I believed the right things. Now I'm an atheist. And I believe that once I die, that's it. It's over. I go to sleep and I don't wake up. Now whatever happens to my energy and the universe, that's... I am not smart enough to figure that out. Um, and I really don't care because <laughs> I won't have any consciousness about it. So, you know, if people will say, well, I believe you do that. Yeah, okay, believe what you want. I, I just don't. I just believe I'm going to sleep and I won't wake up. And I'm okay with that. In fact, I really like sleep. And it's not a bad, <laughs> it's not the worst thing in the world, guys. It's not the end of the world. You're just dying. Um, but what I've found in my communications in the last few months, and especially with my evangelical family, they do not know what to do with this. And what I've learned, I've coined this phrase, my Christian friends and family have what I call a fetish for the afterlife. Wherein they are so focused on what's next. If you're good, and pray the right prayer, you go to heaven. If you're bad and unfortunately born in the wrong part of the world, you go to hell. And because of that, anytime you focus on something that's coming, you're going to diminish what's here now. And that's what I've seen. They're so caught up in afterlife and eternal life and eternity that they can't embrace me in the here and now in my humanity as a human being. And they, don't, they stay away, they don't call, they don't come by, they don't have anything to say to me except, I'm praying for you. <laughs> whoop, whoop. How's that working out? Um, and I don't, I don't respond in a mean or unkind way, I just say thank you and, and let it go at that. But what I, what I want to say to them and what I will, because I'm increasingly out of fucks, is that, is that <laughs> why can't you embrace me as a human. My atheist friends, on the other hand, they have, have run toward my pain. They get in my pain with me. They come around, they want to spend time with me. They call me, they say, how are you doing? How do you feel today? Is there anything you want to do? Let's go hang out. Um, they're not afraid of it. They're not um, in denial of it. And, and it's, it's an incredible contrast that I've seen. Um, I feel sorry for evangelical Christians because they're missing life, many of them. They're missing the here and now because their, their eye is on the sky. And they're focused on what they think is coming, but really they don't know. And that's the truth. Um, and and I, I feel bad that we can't connect in a better way in this current season of my life because... My days are indeed limited, and, and I value relationships so much. I value community and humanity and connecting with people. <laughs> Excuse me. Last night we had a get-together, and, and some of our, our friends in the EA, the Everyone's Agnostic Community, I'd kind of known them online, and, and we got to meet face-to-face, -face and I love that so much. It's such a high for me. Um, so... The atheist community um, and the humanist community, agnostic community, whatever label you happen to wear, it it's, 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 it's gives people the ability to live in the, in the now and, and live in the moment. And living in the moment is something that I know can be hard to do because you guys have responsibilities and schedules and commitments. I don't. So, you know, if, 
if we get another four years of Trump, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> but it's not my problem. <clears throat> so there's some advantages to this, you see. I can joke about this. It's morbid, I know. Um, and the other issue that I'm talking about is the whole idea of how we die in, in America. And, and it's a problem. It, it's problematic. And I know you guys are working on that here. And right now there's nothing going on in Tennessee that I'm aware of. So I've got to get busy with that. Um, I think that the reason that these laws are in place is because of the undergirding of Christianity in this country. It makes no sense otherwise to not allow a person in, in a situation like mine, when I get to the place where I don't feel like it's, um, where I don't feel like the quality of my life is acceptable to me, and I, by the way, should get to decide when that is. Not you, and not the government, and not a loved one, but me. It's my life, and I've only got one. So I, we've got a lot of work to do um, everywhere to get laws changed so that people, um, people can make choices of their own when the time comes. And so I intend to get a little more active in that. Right now, my focus is on um, living life and grabbing moments and car paying the fucking diem as much as I can, as long as I can, because I know is if, if this progresses, I'm going to lose, I'm going to inc increasingly lose functionality. Um, if I lose the ability to talk, I'm screwed. I just <laughs> don't know what I'll do if I can't talk. My people around me are probably going to love it, but you know, <laughs> finally he shut up, finally. Um, but I, I just want to do the things I can do while I can do them. That's why I'm traveling internationally. Um, because that gets harder. Uh, travel now is hard, period. I can't lift a bag up in an overhead bin. Um, pulling credit cards out of, out of slots are difficult. I don't have the finger strength. So little things that you would never think of. I, I, I don't wear button shirts, by the way, because it takes me about an hour to button one. Um, so you get to dress a lot more casually in this situation. But I want to just be as active and busy as I can, as long as I can. And I want to keep talking about uh, a subject no one likes to talk about, and that's dying. And, and I just want to do my little part to take the fear away from it. It's, it's not, it's, you know, the Bible treats, the Bible creates the fear in Christians. It says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. It's not an enemy. When did it become an enemy? It's just the end of life. It's just what happens to all of us. So I want to talk about it and talk about, when I, when I talk about dying out loud, that's really more means living out loud and, and living the moments, finding the moments and encouraging people to do that. It's kind of funny. We have a local meetup <coughs> in, our, in Nashville of ex-Christian atheists and we meet once a month and so the meeting we had just after my diagnosis was, was just laden with emotion. Everyone was very emotional. Um, it was all about me, uh, which it usually is. No, it's really not, but it is now. And everyone was talking about how they reacted to the, getting the news and how they were feeling. And it was very emotional. A lot of tears. Because um, I'm a really big deal at home. <laughs> Now, we have a very loving community, and we're really, really close, and it, it's been hard on a lot of people, <sighs> and I'm aware of that. So, um, people were sharing. We check in. We, everybody shares a few minutes, and one of, our, one of the ladies shared how that she was doing something during the week, and she was all frustrated and, and irritated and and she just stopped and said, oh, my God, why, Dave wouldn't be upset about this. He wouldn't be getting all, you know, he wouldn't get, let this get to him, was what she was saying. And somebody across the room said, yeah, yeah, what would Dave do? And, and then someone said, yeah, WWDD. <laughs> so instead of 
WWJD bracelets. We now have WWDD bracelets. And we're selling them on our website. Um, because it's just a little reminder, you know? Just, if you got that on, you're getting all flustered, just look down and say, oh, just, it doesn't matter. You know, very few things really matter when we cut down to it. You know, we get caught up in, in all this stuff, of, and it, just stop a minute and, and just pause and back up, take a deep breath, and say, what would Dave do? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, that's, that's why this place is here, so that we can uh, speak the truth. And uh, yeah. we heard some truth this morning. So uh, do remember, everyonesagnostic.com. Is that the way? Everyonesagnostic.com.